Hey everybody, welcome. Um, can you all hear me, Lauren, Marty? Good? Awesome. Um, we'll wait just another minute um, for any other attendees to join and then we will get started. All right, we can get started because I know um, we have a short amount of time today. So welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Becca Melnick and I'm the Assistant Director of Admissions here at the Yale School of Public Health. Joining me today is Martin Klein, who's our Director of the Executive MPH Program. Um, Lauren Babcock Dunning, who is our Director of Online and Certificate Education, and Heather Daly, who will be moderating um, the session today, is our Online Programs Administrator. If you have any questions, technical problems, um, feel free to, to private chat Heather and she can help you on the back end. Um, today in this session, we're going to go through a little bit of information about our Executive Online MPH program. I'm going to talk about the program, how it's structured, the curriculum, as well as how to apply. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A. Um, we'll take some as we go and answer quite a few at the end. Um, you know, this is a general session. We do have a lot of information. So if you have personal questions on your unique situation, we are more than happy to help. Um, feel free to just reach out to us um, individually. You know, we'll talk a little bit more about our roles and how we may be able to help and we'll have some contact information at the end. Um, but please don't hesitate to use the Q&A for questions as they come up. Um, and with that, I think we will get started. Um, so I'm going to start with just a, cute, a few quick facts about the School of Public Health, um, just to get you acquainted with kind of who we are. Um, we are located in New Haven, Connecticut, we're about halfway between Boston and New York. Um, the program we're talking about today, the Online Executive MPH program, is primarily an online program, um, but as you'll hear more about it, it does have on-campus components, so we want to make sure you know where we're located. Um, we have a few different degree programs here at the Yale School of Public Health. Um, the program we're speaking about today, the Online Executive MPH, as well as a few on-campus MPH programs. Um, our two-year Master of Public Health, our Advanced Professionals Master of Public Health, our Accelerated MBA MPH degree, as well as MS and PhD programs and dual degree programs across Yale. Um, here at YSPH, um, we have about 400 MPH students on campus 
in any given year, as well as 51 MS and 85 PhD students. So you'll kind of see as you look at our programs and others that we are a relatively kind of smaller school and program. Um, you know, we really think that that is a benefit and really use that to our advantage in terms of how our students engage on campus, interact with faculty, and we will talk a little bit more about that experience as we as we go through the presentation today. So now I'm going to turn it over to Martin and Lauren to talk a little bit more about the Executive Online MPH. Thank you, Becca. We're very excited to be here with you today. Uh, this program is the product of two years of planning, working with faculty, alumni, and industry leaders to bring to you the best possible experience that focuses on the skills, knowledge, and competencies that working professionals need both to excel in their given jobs, as well as to become leaders in their field. So we'll tell you a little bit about the program. So um, it's a two year part-time program. It's a hybrid format in that most of the content is delivered online, but we also have three on-site intensives and I'll tell you a little bit about those. And you know, it's designed for working professionals. That's how we've shaped the content, the structure and the curriculum. So because it's an executive MPH, we ask that applicants have relevant experience. So if you've got a bachelor's degree, that would be four years of experience, a master's degree, at least two years of experience, or if you have a doctoral degree in a relevant field. Now, the question of relevant work experience can take two forms. That can either directly be relevant health, health care, public health experience, but it can also be experience in a field and using skills and knowledge that would allow you to be an impactful public health professional. So for example, if you've been spending the last five years working at Amazon on supply chain and you've decided because of the pandemic, you wanna apply those skills to vaccine distribution in developing countries, that would be an example of relevant experience. Uh, in addition to the broad overview that we provide of public health, we're also offering four tracks. And again, I'll talk them about them in a little more detail, but they're health informatics, environmental health sciences, applied analytic methods in epidemiology and essential public health skills. And as you'll see, the way this works is the four tracks, each track consists of three courses. And to meet your track obligation, you need to select one track, which will give you three courses. And then you need to identify three additional courses, either from a second track or by taking courses from the three other tracks to total the six courses. So this is what the curriculum looks like. And so we've been very purposeful and intentional in structuring an experience that has some unity both within these various areas and then across these areas. So the first thing that we're focused on is management and leadership. This is an executive MPH. We want to give you core and advanced foundational knowledge in your chosen areas of interest, but we also want to provide you with the skills you need to be leaders and change makers within your organization and the broader community. So these on-campus intensives, each of them will be five days long. They're led by the Global Health Leadership Initiative, which is a Yale-based organization with over a decade's work of it, worth of experience working around the world in training individuals to become leaders and managers. That will be complemented by an online course using evidence to drive decisions, which works very closely and in tandem, in tandem with the on-campus intensives. And then the next area is core public health knowledge. This is typical to what you'll find at all accredited schools of public health, that the titles of the courses may change, but in the main, this is the foundational knowledge that you need to be considered and to act as a public health professional. And then the tracks that I briefly mentioned, there are opportunities for you to specialize either in one track or two tracks. And then the last part of this two year experience is a year long capstone course. And you can think of that as the integrative experience. So basically what that does is it allows you to take, you know, the knowledge, skills and abilities that you've learned in year one and that you're learning in year two and apply them ideally to your place of business. So you'll have a project that you'll work on that will draw upon these skills and will provide both benefit to you and the organization. So you'll in essence be learning by doing. So, and this briefly is the two-year schedule. We start in the summer, 
which will be in the summer of 2021. And it, we actually start in late June. That's when the first intensive will be. And then over the course of the summer, there'll be two of the core courses. And then you can see fall, spring. And then again in year two, you'll have either core courses or track courses. Interspersed with that will be these on-site intensives. As I mentioned, there were three of them. Each of them are five days long. The first and third will be in June. And the second that you see here in the spring semester will be sometime during the spring break. And there'll also be a, a half credit ethics course. So we feel this is a nice way to space out, you know, what you need in terms of your core courses, the track courses, and these experiential elements as well. And so one thing that I wanna add is we're very keen to make this a learning community. So we recognize that the individuals who are in this program are gonna have deep knowledge and skills across a broad array of areas. And so through these intensives, through the way that we structure our courses, we're gonna give all of you an opportunity not only to learn from our faculty, but to learn from each other as well. So I'm gonna very quickly go over the tracks so you get a sense of what they are. The first is the health informatics track. The school offers uh, MS in health informatics at the School of Medicine. There is a very large health informatics group. So we draw from faculty at the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine to teach these topics. Some of, their, some of them are clinicians, some of them are more, more research focused, but all of them are focused on providing advanced skills in health informatics that can be applied in your place of work. Our second track is environmental health sciences, and we here deal with some of what we think are the, the basic areas. And I think this gives me an opportunity to highlight the quality of the faculty that we've recruited to be in this program. So for example, exposure assessment is being co-taught and one of the faculty members is leading efforts now to identify and monitor the coronavirus in the environment. For our hazard identification course, they're being co-taught by the chair of the department, as well as someone who is now a faculty member who has senior level federal experience. And our risk assessment and policy course is being taught by a faculty member who also heads up the Environmental Health Center for the New York State Department of Health. So you can see that the kind of faculty that we bring are both skilled researchers, but also have a lot of very relevant practical experience in policy, regulatory affairs, and government. Our, our epidemiology track to provide shorthand will provide students who are interested in that with a very solid foundation in basic and applied and advanced analytic skills and epidemiological methods. You will take a core course, which is Epi 1, then you'll have Epi 2 and these other courses that you see here, applied analytic methods and advanced analytic methods. And here again, we're drawing on faculty from the School of Public Health as well as the School of Medicine. And at the School of Medicine, we have faculty who have clinical experience so they can really bring out some of the real world issues that you may be encountering. And that'll be balanced very nicely with our public health faculty. who can talk more about sort of population-based issues as well. And then the fourth is, is something that we created specifically for this program. And by that, I mean that each of these courses is a new course we thought about what are some of the essential skills that students will need in order to be effective and impactful public health professionals. So these are three new courses, monitoring and evaluation. Anybody who has done field-based work knows that monitoring and evaluation is really critical. Leading transformational change, you've recruited an outside faculty member who's also a senior member of the healthcare system who writes on and does podcasts on how to lead transformational change within organizations. And the third course is Introduction to Public Health Modeling. For those of you who are aware, you'll know that modeling is becoming increasingly a resource that's being used to try to understand different future scenarios. So our feeling is that you may not need to be able to do public health modeling, but there are very few areas of public health where it won't be of benefit to at least understand the basic concepts and ideas of what public health modeling is. And now I'll let my colleague Lauren take it from here. 
Okay. Um, so one of the things that was really important while we were thinking about how to structure the program was really um, putting together a program that uh, is one that is accessible and works for somebody who has work obligations, family obligations. Um, so we feel like what we've done combines the best of being able to be on campus at Yale and have um, an in-person experience where you see the campus, you meet with faculty, you meet with peers, you network, um, but also allows you to not have to um, give up your job, give up your family time, um, move to New Haven. And so the way that we've structured the lecture content um, is that it's divided into short segments so that you can watch those at your convenience. Um, they're high quality. They're the same kind of content that we use on campus. They're just segmented in ways that, you know, if you have 10 minutes between meetings, you can fit in watching a part of your lecture. Um, so we're trying to really make it something that works um, for people who are working. We also um, want to make sure that you do form those strong peer relationships and those relationships with faculty. So for each course, um, there's a live synchronous session, meaning like a real time video discussion. Um, and each of the courses are small. So those discussion groups are with 20 or fewer students so that you really get to know each other um, in addition to sort of meeting in person. Um, the, the specialized tracks, in addition to letting you dive deep into an area of focus, are another way that um, you can have sort of a, an even smaller course experience um, because those in the program will sort of subdivide themselves between the tracks. So um, in terms of your coursework, each semester you're going to take two online courses which are delivered um, by a Canvas, which some of you may have encountered. It's an online course um, management system. Your sort of weekly flow will be that you'll review the high quality recorded lectures, um, the supplemental materials, which could include readings. Um, you'll work on assignments and then you'll meet uh, with your faculty and with your peers during those live discussions. During the on-campus intensives that are done uh, with GHLA, who are experts in doing this kind of training, um, you'll start to form that um, learning community that Marty mentioned, where you get a chance to meet each other, to meet with the faculty, and then you take those relationships back with you when you go back to your job, to your home, and begin the program. Um, and Another um, aspect of the program that we think is strong is, you know, whatever we're doing for this program, we're also doing um, in parallel to our on-campus program. And we have a very strong uh, career services organization within the school um, that are able to help you remotely. Um, as alumni of the program, you'll be tapped into our very substantial alumni network. So that includes 6,000 YSPH alumni, but it also includes the broader um, Yale network which we all know um, as working professionals that you know, your ability to network and to move on to new opportunities um, is a really important facet of continuing uh, your, your career trajectory. And so now I'll um, let Becca tell you all a bit more about the financial aid. <clears throat> Excuse me, happy to. Um, Heather, do we also have the how to apply? I um, just want to make sure we're not mi missing anything. So I'll start with how to apply and then we'll talk a little bit about financial aid. Um, so the application to the program is in something called SOFAST, the Schools and Schools of Public Health Application Service. And this is basically a common application for all schools and programs of public health. So it really helps to centralize the process if, if you are applying to multiple programs. Um, the application process is very similar across all of our MPH programs. So you'll know on our website, um, you know, you'll, there's a program page for the online uh, executive MPH program and all of the information on our admissions pages about how to apply will also apply to this program. Um, we require the materials you see here, um, a resume or CV, your official transcripts from any 
college level or beyond coursework you've completed, as well as three letters of recommendation. Um, in SOFAST, these materials are common across all of the programs you'll apply to, so you really just need to send them in once um, if you're applying to, to multiple schools. Um, the things that are unique to us are our personalized statement of purpose and our description and verification of quantitative ability. So first for the statement of purpose, this is where we want to hear about you, your story and your interests. Why are you applying to this program and what are your goals? Um, you know, I think one of the most important pieces of advice I give to students in the process is to remember that we see your resume and we will see the things you've done. We want to understand in your statement what those have taught you and how they've gotten you to this point. Why is it that you want to do what you want to do? Um, and I think this addresses a lot of the questions we've seen in the Q&A about what does relevant work experience mean? Do you need to be working in the public health field? Um, Martin talked a little bit about this at the beginning, um, but it's more about your ability to draw a connection between your experiences and what you want to be doing. Um, so, you know, what is it about what you've done that you're connecting now to public health and how do you think this degree is going to help you moving forward what are your goals and what do you want to do with the degree uh, those are really important kind of things to touch on um, the second piece is that description and verification of quantitative ability. For this year's application process, we have waived the GRE requirement due to kind of COVID complications. Um, in its place, we do want to understand your quantitative experience. The so GRE tests both quantitative and verbal skills. We feel like we see your verbal skills from other materials like your statement of purpose, um, but want to make sure that you quantitatively have some either background or abilities to succeed in this area. So we just want kind of an understanding of your experience. You know, it doesn't need to be fancy either. You don't need like a nice intro and conclusion. Just these are the things I've done. I took this class. I got this grade. Um, this is what I do professionally. Kind of you're going to list out what you've done. And then in the verification, you're going to describe a little bit more about that. Um, give us a little more context to kind of prove or, or show examples of the things you've referenced. So someone had asked about, um, you can include an abstract. Yes, if the abstract doesn't provide context as to how that experience um, has shown your quantitative skills, you can write up a little paragraph summary. It's more just to give us a little bit more context to what you've described in the description section. Um, there will be, or there are examples on our website um, of kind of what we're looking for for these sections, and I'm happy to talk more about them. Um, for somebody had asked about completing the MBA, will the transcript su suffice? So the application will still ask you to submit those materials, um, but the statement can say, I completed an MBA, I took these classes, I got these grades, um, and kind of upload maybe an example of a project or something you've done. Um, we will take exam scores in that section if you have them. Again, you just need to say, I took the exam, I got this grade. So I can talk a lot more in detail um, in other forums about kind of what this looks like. I am hosting an, a session on um, putting together a strong application um, and that'll be November 2nd. So feel free to join me for that. Um, so moving on to talk a little bit about financial aid. Um, the program, um, how it is set up right now, all students will receive a $10,000 scholarship for the program um, in these, correct me if I'm wrong, in this first year. Um, the exception to that is if the program is being fully funded by someone else. So if you have full funding from your employer, if you have a full scholarship from another source, that is, um, you would not receive that scholarship. But in any other situation, that is given to every student in the program. And there's nothing else you need to do to apply for this. Um, outside of that, um, we recommend that all students who are U.S. citizens and permanent residents complete the FAFSA. This will help our director of financial aid get you information about loans, if that's something that you want to pursue about federal loans. Um, she, Jen Farkas, who is our director of financial aid, is a wonderful resource, and she can speak to you more about the funding process. She's also hosting a workshop coming up on funding your education um, and can can really work with students one on one on that process and how to find external funding as well. 
So I think that wraps up kind of most of what we have formally. Um, and I know we've answered a bunch of, bunch of questions and we're happy to kind of, I'll turn it over to Heather to kind of direct some questions. Sure, so it, can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay. So it looks like uh, we have three questions in the Q&A right now. We have about five minutes left. So if you do have questions, feel free to drop them in that Q&A uh, and we'll try to get to them. But if not, you'll see the um, email address up there on the top at ysph.admissions at yale.edu if we don't get to your question. So I see one that says, is your program applicable to public policy positions? Is it primarily quantitatively focused? Yeah, so I would say it, um, there are certainly courses that are going to be dealing with policy. One of the courses is health policy and management and a number of the other courses, if you're talking about global health or domestic issues, you know, policy is unavoidable and that's important to add to the discussion. But I will say you need to look at the tracks. So if you can't see yourself taking at least one track and three courses from the other tracks, you know, then you should think about whether this is the right program for you. You know, I would argue that the critical skills and public health track has important elements that are related to policy. But if you have a specific goal, then you need to weigh that goal against the opportunities for the tracks and the courses and decide if, if this is in fact the best program for you. It, it includes both qualitative and quantitative elements as most generalist MPHs would. Great. We have another one that says, does your program assist in job placement? Becca, do you want to take that? I know you've had a lot of experience with, with that. Uh, yes, I, you know, Lauren talked a little bit about um, career services um, and they are a great resource for all of our students. They work across all of our MPH programs and yes, we'll help you explore your um, your goals, your interests, you know, some students will use this program to, you know, help advance within their positions and their careers where they're at, gain more skills kind of along the path of what you're currently doing. And other students are looking to this program to kind of make a career pivot. Um, our career services team has seen kind of everything in that spectrum and is really happy to help you. They do a lot of one-on-one -on -one counseling. Um, they can help you, you know, connect with alumni, explore what's out there. We have a lot of recruiters who they engage with, a lot of job postings that are sent directly to our career services team from alumni, from students who have, you know, um, from recruiters who have, have um, hired our students before. Um, and that is one of, you know, really the benefits of, of a program like this is the kind of historical, um, I guess are like established connections the school already has and you know people know our brand our name our program um, and like to hire our students so yes there's a lot of support in kind of that job um, search process okay great someone asked um, what's the mean median and range of student age i'm not sure if we have those numbers becca do you know so this program is newly launched this year. So I can tell you plenty of stats about our kind of on-campus MP um, group, but I don't know how relevant that would be kind of to this program. You know, we are looking for students here who have that experience. So, you know, I think the biggest comparison is our advanced professionals on campus program. Um, you know, we have everywhere from students who are just coming out of medical school to professionals who have been working for 30 years. Um, so it really kind of, and it will vary year to year. Um, so you'll really get kind of a wide range of perspectives um, and of experiences in the students that we have kind of here in the program. Thank you. Someone had asked if the links to the other sessions can be shared or emailed. Becca, I think they're referring to the, um, the other sessions or where to find those. Yep, um, I'm going to try to pull up the links now. I can send them in the answer to the Q&A. And yes, uh, as a follow up to this event, we'll send out an email and I can include them in that as well. So happy to. They're also all on our site. So if you go to admissions.publichealth.yale.edu, um, there's an events and contacts page and everything um, should be listed on that page. That's probably the best place to find it. Uh, what is the total tuition for the two years? Um, yeah, so the, the total tuition is $80,000. It's on a per credit basis and it mirrors the 
costs for the on-site program. And, you know, as we've mentioned, we're offering a $10,000 scholarship for every student. So the total tuition cost is $70,000. And then we encourage individuals. I saw there was a question about somebody who's working at the CDC and will the CDC provide some support. We certainly encourage you to check with your employer or if there is any kind of tuition rebate or any kind of continuing education funds that are offered. And then we do provide a link on our website to the federal guidelines because in certain cases, and again, you'd need to discuss that with your accountant, your costs to pursue an education in a related field may have some tax implications, but that's something you'd need to discuss with an accountant or, or someone else who's uh, privy to your finances. Great, thank you. Um, I do wanna note that it's just about 1.30, uh, but we're gonna stay on for a little bit longer. If people have questions, we'll keep answering questions um, for at least another five minutes. Uh, but if not, and if you have to run, please feel free to email um, if you have additional questions that didn't get answered. So it looks like we have another one here. Um, do the courses in each semester run concurrently or is each course seven weeks each? That's a good question. Yeah. So the courses are, are 13 weeks long, and that's the same length as the on-site courses. And typically at any given time, in any given semester, there will be two courses that run concurrently. If the course is offered in the summer, then it's not a 13-week course. Of course, it'll probably be about a seven-week course. But they're either 13 weeks if they're during the semester, fall or spring, and they're roughly seven weeks if they're offered. And we've tried to do it so that there are no more than two courses at any one time. There, there's, a, you know, there's an ethics half credit course, but in the main, it's two courses per semester. Thanks. Will there be opportunities for guest speakers during our live sessions? Well, you know, that would be up to the faculty member if that's something that they think is important and adds value to the experience. So, you know, in large part, in terms of the course content and structure, we're driven by what the faculty think are the best approaches. You know, one of the nice things about doing something online, of course, is that there's an opportunity to have guest lecturers come uh, virtually. And so there's no time involved other than the time that she or he needs to take to participate. But that would be up to the faculty themselves. Can you give some examples of what a capstone project looks like? Um, you know, one example could be um, I work in a large healthcare system. My healthcare system is now thinking of acquiring a 18 bed small community hospital in a rural part of the state. Uh, does it make sense for us to acquire that hospital? That hospital? What are the economies of scale? How can we benefit that community? What will it cost us? to improve services. So basically think about your organization, think about some challenge that um, it has or some question that you or you think they need to answer. And then think about something that would roughly require, you know, let's say seven hours a week of your time over the course of say 30 or 40 weeks to come up with a, a, a proposal, a proposed solution. And then what you'll do at the end of that capstone course is present your solution to your fellow students and the faculty. I see one here that says, um, if I'm making a career pivot and onboarding after being home with my children for a few years, don't have relevant professional letter writers, what are your suggestions? That's a great question. Um, generally, you know, the recommendation letters are a great way for us to understand a little bit more about you and kind of all of the other pieces of your application. So, you know, both your um, experience in the field, your academic preparedness, your interest area. Um, so we do want to see some from someone who was kind of either seeing you in any of those capacities. So it can be through from someone, you know, in, you know, in a volunteer capacity. Um, but it, we do want to see some someone who can speak to either your academics, your professional experience, or kind of your, um, your experience within public health. 
Um, so I would say, you know, that's, we can talk a little bit more specifically about, you know, one-on-one -on -one about, you know, brainstorming some other um, examples, but those are the kinds of things we want to see. We want letters to be able to comment on the things we may not see elsewhere in your application. So we, you know, big picture want confidence that you're academically going to be able to succeed in the program and that you're going to be able to get the most out of it. This I text answered another question. Um, kind of similarly in terms of what we're looking for, um, right? We want to know you're going to get you're going to have a positive experience. So we want to make sure you're going to do okay academically and we want to make sure, you know, you have goals and that this program is going to help meet those. Um, so all of your materials should kind of be one cohesive unit that helps us understand your story. Um, and so re the recommendations are a part of your story and contributing to kind of how you've gotten to this place and where you want to go kind of moving forward. Great. And I think we have time for just one more question, maybe. Uh, it says, will students be assigned specific mentors within the program? So, um, you know, there are various levels of support. You know, I'm, of course, available to every student and plan on meeting every student. Heather is available for the administrative support. In terms of formal mentors and, you know, academic guides, each of the tracks has a track coordinator. And one of the responsibilities of that track coordinator is to be in touch with and engaged with every student in terms of their current work and their career aspirations. And above and beyond that, I would say, you know, if you've identified with a certain faculty member, either in the core course or track course, you're certainly welcome to reach out and engage that individual for advice and suggestions. You know, the question of what becomes a mentoring relationship is a little more complicated and nuanced, but the track coordinator is there, I'm there, and of course you should feel free to reach out to any faculty member in, in the program with any questions or advice that you might need. Great, and I see just one more here actually that looks like it'd be relevant. Uh, it says, are off-site students integrated with on-site students or is it the same class or different classes? Do you video? Yeah, no, they're, they're, this is a, a separate program uh, there are the three five-day intensives, and in within those five-day intensives, there are opportunities to integrate with faculty at the school and the experience of being at Yale, but courses aren't mixed between online and on-site students. And that's done intentionally so that um, the content can be tailored for working professionals. It sort of takes into consideration the fact that you all will have um, a different experience than somebody entering the two-year program. And so it really is done so that you're able to meet with each other, meet with the faculty and have a unique learning experience tailored to working professionals. And you know, Heather, I see one more question from yeah. Julian that maybe it might be good actually for for Becca to, to answer this for, our, for all of our edification. Yeah. yeah, it looked like Becca had answered a couple um, via typing, but go ahead, Becca, thank you. Yeah, I was trying to type out a question to this the, about visas. Um, if you are an international student here on a visa that allows you to enroll in the program and complete a, an educational program while you're here, that is fine. We are not able to sponsor new visas for the program. Um, it would be up to kind of what the um, stipulations are around your visa. And our Office of International Students and Scholars is a great resource. Um, you're welcome to reach out to them. Um, on their site, they list out advisors by school and Kira, um, Kira Bellucci is our advisor, um, but we're happy to talk to you. I would reach out to us um, kind of individually just to talk about kind of specific visa statuses and what is isn't and is not allowed. Um, so yeah. And Becca, at the top there, the ysph.admissions at yale.edu, is that the best email to reach you at? Yep, um, that's a great way to reach us. That comes to me directly. I answer almost every question coming into that inbox. Um, you know, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. We are here to help you, to help you learn about the program, to determine if it's a good fit, um, to help you kind of through the application process. So don't hesitate at all to reach out. Um, you know, mention you were on the webinar today just to kind of give some context. Um, but yeah, don't hesitate at any time. Um, like I mentioned, we have a whole bunch of other events coming up. 
um, over the next few weeks. Um, so please join us and, and we look forward to uh, connecting with you again. Thank you all so much for joining today. Thank you all. Bye-bye.